Chapter 1, Part 2 of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book 2, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Rev. Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 34. And I saw, and bear record, that this is the Son of God. Sure is the witness, who, what he hath actually seen, that he also speaketh, for haply he was not ignorant of that which is written, that which thine eyes have seen, tell. I saw then, says he, the sign, and understood that which was signified by it. I bear record that this is the Son of God, who was proclaimed by the law, that is, through Moses, and heralded by the voice of the holy prophets. The blessed evangelist seems to me again to say with some great confidence, this is the Son of God, that is, the One, the Only by nature, the Heir of the own nature of the Father, to whom we too, sons by adoption, are conformed, and through whom we are called by grace to the dignity of sonship. For as from God the Father every family in heaven and earth is named, from His being properly and first and truly Father, so is all sonship, too, from the Son, by reason of his being properly and alone truly Son, not bastard nor falsely called, but of the essence of God the Father, not by off-cutting or emanation or division or severance, for the divine nature is altogether impassable, but as one of one, ever coexisting and co-eternal and innate in him who begat him, being in him, and coming forth from him, indivisible and without dimensions, since the divinity is neither after the manner of a body, nor bounded by space, nor of nature such as to make progressive footsteps. But like as from fire proceedeth the heat that is in it, appearing to be separate from it in idea, and to be other than it, though it is of it and in it by nature and proceedeth from it without suffering any harm in the way of off-cutting, division, or emanation, for it is preserved whole in the whole fire. So shall we conceive of the divine offspring too, thinking thereon in a manner most worthy of God, and believing that the Son subsists of himself, yet not excluding him from the one ineffable Godhead, nor saying that he is other in substance than the Father. For then would he no longer be rightly conceived of as Son, but something other than he, and a new God would arise, other than he that only is. For how shall not that which is not consubstantial with God by nature wholly fall away from being very God? But since the blessed Baptist is both trustworthy and of the greatest repute, and testifieth that this is the Son of God, we will confess the Son to be altogether very God, and of the essence of the Father. For this, and nothing else, does the name of sonship signify to us. 35.36 Again the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Already had the blessed Baptist pointed him out before, but, lo, repeating again the same words, he points Jesus out to his disciples, and calls him the Lamb of God and says that he taketh away the sin of the world, all but bringing his hearers to remembrance of him who saith in the prophets, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions, and will not remember thy sins. But not in vain does the Baptist repeat the same account of the Saviour, for it belongs to skill in teaching, to infix in the souls of the disciples the not yet received word not shrinking at repetition, but rather enduring it for the profit of the pupils. For therefore does the blessed Paul too say, To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. 37. 
and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Seest thou the fruit, handmaid of teaching, yielded therefrom? Seest thou how great gain accrued from repetition? Let him then who is entrusted with teaching learn from this, to show himself superior to all indolence, and to esteem silence more hurtful to himself than to his hearers, and not to bury the Lord's talent in listless sloth, as in the earth, but rather to give his money to the exchangers. For the Saviour will receive his own with usury, and will quicken his seed the word cast in. You have here a most excellent proof of what has been said. For the Baptist, not shrinking from pointing out the Lord to his disciples, and from saying a second time, Behold the Lamb of God, is seen to have so greatly profited them, as to at length even persuade them to follow him, and already to desire discipleship under him. 38. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? Fitly does the Lord turn to them that follow him, that thou mayest learn in act that which is sung, I sought the Lord, and he heard me. For while we do not yet seek the Lord by good habits and rightness in believing, we are in some sort behind him. But when thirsting after his divine law, we track the holy and choice way of righteousness, then at length will he look upon us, crying aloud what is written, Turn ye unto me, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But he saith unto them, What seek ye? Not as though ignorant, whence could it be so, for he knoweth all things as God, but making the question a beginning and root of his discourse. They said unto him, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Like people well instructed do they that are asked reply, for already do they call him Master, thereby clearly signifying their readiness to learn. Then they beg to know his home, as about therein to tell him at a fit season of their need, for probably they did not think it right to make talk on needful subjects the companion of a journey. Be what is said again to us for a useful pattern. 39. He saith unto them, Come and see. He doth not point out the house, though asked to do it, but rather bids them come forthwith to it, teaching first, as by example, that it is not well to cast delays in the way of search after what is good, for delay in things profitable is altogether hurtful. And this too besides, that to those who are still ignorant of the holy house of our Saviour Christ, that is, the church, it will not suffice to salvation that they should learn where it is, but that they should enter into it by faith, and see the things mystically wrought therein. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Assiduously did the disciples apply themselves to the attainment of the knowledge of the divine mysteries, for I do not think that a fickle mind beseems those who desire to learn, but rather one most painstaking, and superior to feeble-mindedness in good toils, so as during their whole lifetime to excel in perfect zeal. For this I think the words, they abode with him that day, darkly signify. But when he says, it was about the tenth hour, we adapting our own discourse to each man's profit, say that in this very thing, the compiler of divinity through this so subtle handling again teacheth us, that not in the beginning of the present world was the mighty mystery of our Saviour made known, but when time now draws towards its close. For in the last days, as it is written, we shall be all taught of God. Take again, I pray, as an image of what has been said about the tenth hour, the disciples cleaving to the Saviour, of whom the holy evangelist says that having once become his guest, they abode with him, that they who through faith have entered into the holy house and have run to Christ, 
may learn that it needs to abide with him and not to desire to be again estranged either turning aside into sin or again returning to unbelief forty forty one forty two one of the two which heard john speak and followed him was andrew simon peter's brother he first findeth his own brother simon and saith unto him we have found the messias which is being interpreted the christ and he brought him to jesus they who even now received the talent straightway make traffic of their talent and bring it to the lord for such are in truth obedient and docile souls, not needing many words for profit, nor bearing the fruit of their instruction, after revolutions of years or months, but attaining the goal of wisdom along with the commencement of their instruction. For give, it says, instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Andrew then saves his brother, this was Peter, having declared the whole mystery in a brief summary. For we have found, he says, Jesus, as treasure hid in a field, or as one pearl of great price, according to the parables in the Gospels. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. He after a divine sort looketh upon him, who seeth the hearts and reins, and seeth to how great piety the disciple will attain, of how great virtue he will be possessed, and at what consummation he will leave off. For he who knoweth all things before they be is not ignorant of aught, and herein does he specially instruct him that is called, that being very God, he hath knowledge untaught. For not having needed a single word, nor even sought to learn who or whence the man came to him, he says of what father he was born, and what was his own name, and permits him to be no more called Simon, already exercising lordship and power over him, as being his but changes it to Peter from Petra, for upon him was he about to found his church. 43. The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Like-minded with those preceding was Philip, and very ready to follow Christ, for Christ knew that he would be good. Therefore also he says, Follow me making the word a token of the grace that was upon him, and wherein he bid him follow, testifying to him that most excellent was his conversation. For he would not have chosen him, if he had not been altogether good. 45. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Exceeding swift was the disciple unto the bearing fruit, that hereby he might show himself akin in disposition to them that had preceded. For he findeth Nathanael, not simply meeting him coming along, but making diligent search for him. For he knew that he was most painstaking and fond of learning. Then he says that he had found the Christ who was heralded through all the divine scripture, addressing himself not as to one ignorant, but as to one exceedingly well instructed in the learning both of the all-wise Moses and of the prophets. For a not true supposition was prevailing among the Jews as regards our Savior Jesus Christ, that he should be of the city or village of Nazareth, albeit the divine scripture says that he is a Bethlehemite as far as pertains to this. And thou, Bethlehem, it says, in the land of Judah, house of Ephratah, art little to be among the thousands of Judah, for out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. For he was brought up in Nazareth, 
as the evangelist himself to some were testified, saying, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. But he was not thence, but whence we said before, yea, rather, as the voice of the prophet affirmed. Philip, therefore, following the supposition of the Jews, says, Jesus of Nazareth. 46. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel readily agrees that something great and most fair is that which is expected to appear out of Nazareth. It is, I suppose, perfectly clear that not only did he take Nazareth as a pledge of that which he sought, but bringing together knowledge from the law and prophets, as one fond of learning, he gained swift understanding. Come and see. Sight will suffice for faith, says he, and having only conversed with him, you will confess more readily, and will unhesitatingly say that he is indeed the expected one. But we must believe that there was a divine and ineffable grace flowing forth with the words of the Saviour, and alluring the souls of the hearers. For so it is written, that all wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, for as his word is mighty in power, so too is it efficacious to persuade. 47. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Not having yet used proof by means of signs, Christ endeavored in another way to persuade both his own disciples and the wiser of those that came to him, that he was by nature Son and God, but for the salvation of all was come in human form. What then was the mode that led to faith? God befitting knowledge. For knowledge of all things befitteth God alone. He receiveth therefore Nathanael, not hurrying him by flatteries to this state, but by those things whereof he was conscious, giving him a pledge, that he knoweth the hearts as God. 48. Whence knowest thou me? Nathanael begins to wonder, and is called to a now firm faith, but desires yet to learn whence he has the knowledge concerning him for very accurate are learning-seeking and pious souls. But perhaps he supposed that somewhat of him had been shown to the Lord by Philip. Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. The Saviour undid his surmise, saying that even before his meeting and conversing with Philip, he had seen him under the fig tree, though not present in body. Very profitably are both the fig tree and the place named, pledging to him the truth of his having been seen. For he that has already accurate knowledge of what was with him will readily be admitted. 49. Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. He knows that God alone is searcher of hearts, and giveth to none other of men to understand the mind considering as is likely that verse in the Psalms, God trieth the hearts and reigns. For as accruing to none else, the psalmist hath attributed this too as peculiar to the divine nature only. When then he knew that the Lord saw his thoughts revolving in his mind in yet voiceless whispers, straightway he calls him Master, readily entering already into discipleship under him, and confesses him Son of God and King of Israel, in whom are inexistent the properties of divinity, and as one well instructed he affirms him to be holy and by nature God. 50. Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? thou shalt see greater things than these. Thou shalt be firmer unto faith, saith he, when thou seest greater things than these. For he that believed one sign, how shall he not by means of many be altogether bettered, especially since they shall be more wonderful than those now wondered at? 51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Common now to all is the word which seals the faith of Nathanael. But in saying that angels shall be seen speeding up and down upon the Son of Man, that is, ministering and serving his commands, for the salvation of such as shall believe, he says that then especially shall he be revealed as being by nature son of God. For it is not one another that the rational powers serve, but surely God. And this does not take away subjection among the angels, for this will not be reasonably called bondage. But we have heard of the holy evangelist that angels came to our Saviour Christ, and ministered unto him. Chapter 2, 2, 3 And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called, and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Seasonably comes he at length to the beginning of miracles, even if he seems to have been called to it without set purpose. For a marriage feast being held, it is clear that it was altogether holily. The mother of the Saviour is present, and himself also being bidden comes together with his own disciples, to work miracles rather than to feast with them and yet more to sanctify the very beginning of the birth of man, I mean so far as appertains to the flesh. For it was fitting that he, who was renewing the very nature of man, and refashioning it all for the better, should not only impart his blessing to those already called into being, but also prepare before grace for those soon to be born, and make holy their entrance into being. Receive also yet a third reason. It had been said to the woman by God, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. How then was it not needful that we should thrust off this curse too, or how else could we escape a condemned marriage? This to the Saviour, being loving to man, removes. For he, the delight and joy of all, honoured marriage with his presence, that he might expel the old shame of childbearing. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and old things are passed away, as Paul saith, they are become new. He cometh therefore with his disciples to the marriage, for it was needful that the lovers of miracles should be present with the wonder-worker to collect what was wrought as a kind of food to their faith. But when wine failed the feasters, his mother called the Lord, being good according to his wanted love for man, saying, They have no wine. For since it was in his power to do whatsoever he would, she urges him to the miracle. 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Most excellently did the Saviour fashion for us this discourse also, for it behoved him not to come hastily to action, nor to appear a worker of miracles as though of his own accord, but being called, hardly to come thereto, and to grant the grace to the necessity, rather than to the lookers-on. But the issue of things longed for seems somehow to be even more grateful, when granted not offhand to those who ask for it, but through a little delay put forth to most lovely hope. Besides, Christ hereby shows that the deepest honor is due to parents, admitting out of reverence to his mother what he willed not as yet to do. 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do. The woman, having great influence to the performing of the miracle, prevailed, persuading the Lord, on account of what was fitting as her son. She begins the work by preparing the servants of the assembly to obey the things that should be enjoined. 7, 8, 9, 10 
Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water-pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have drunk well, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The ministers accomplished what is commanded, and by unspeakable might was the water changed into wine. For what is hard to him who can do all things? He that calleth into being things which are not, how will he weary, transordering into what he will things already made? They marvel at the thing as strange, for such are Christ's works to look upon. But the governor of the feast charges the bridegroom with expending what was better on the latter end of the feast, not unfitly, as appears to me, according to the narration of the story. 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Many most excellent things were accomplished at once, through the one first miracle. For honorable marriage was sanctified, the curse on women put away, for no more in sorrow shall they bring forth children, now Christ is blessed, the very beginning of our birth. And the glory of our Saviour shone forth as the sun's rays, and more than this, the disciples are confirmed in faith by the miracle. The historical account then will stop here, but I think we ought to consider the other view of what has been said, and to say what is therein signified. The word of God came down then from heaven, as he himself saith, in order that having as a bridegroom made human nature his own, he might persuade it to bring forth the spiritual offspring of wisdom. And hence reasonably is the human nature called the bride, the Saviour, the bridegroom, since Holy Scripture carries up language from human things to a meaning that is above us. The marriage is consummated on the third day, that is, in the last times of the present world, for the number three gives us beginning, middle, end, for thus is the whole of time measured. And in harmony with this do we see that which is said by one of the prophets, He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning. For he smote us for the transgression of Adam, saying, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That which was smitten by corruption and death he bound up on the third day, that is, not in the first, or in the middle, but in the last ages, when for us made man, he rendered all our nature whole, raising it from the dead in himself. Wherefore he is also called the firstfruits of them that slept. Therefore in saying it was the third day, whereon the marriage was being consummated, he signifies the last time. He mentions the place too, for he says it was in Cana of Galilee, let him that loves learning again note well. For not in Jerusalem is the gathering, but without Judea is the fee celebrated, as it were in the country of the Gentiles. For it is Galilee of the Gentiles, as the prophet saith. It is, I suppose, altogether plain that the synagogue of the Jews rejected the bridegroom from heaven, and that the church of the Gentiles received him, and that very gladly. The Saviour comes to the marriage not of his own accord, for he was being bidden by many voices of the saints. But wine failed the feasters, for the law perfected nothing. 
the mosaic writing sufficed not for perfect enjoyment but neither did the measure of implanted sobriety reach forth so as to be able to save us it was therefore true to say of us too they have no wine but the bounteous god doth not overlook our nature worn out with want of good things he set forth wine better than the first for the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life and the law hath no perfection in good things but the divine instructions of gospel teaching bring in fullest blessing the ruler of the feast marvels at the wine for every one i suppose of those ordained to the divine priesthood and entrusted with the house of our saviour christ is astonished at his doctrine which is above the law but christ commanded it to be given to him first because according to the voice of paul the husbandmen that laboureth must be first partakers of the fruits and let the hearer again consider what i say End of chapter 1, part 2